If people have noticed, there's a there's reverberation and echo on my end because I'm in an empty room because I just moved. Um, and we're also, incidentally, in Second Life, for this very special podcast, also in empty space. Now, some would say that's not unusual because everything in Second Life is empty. Where are we right now, George? Uh, it says uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in the background. This is the Explorer Island, which is the sim that was run by the JPL. And JPL is a laboratory uh, run by Caltech for NASA. This was part of the Silence Science Continent, along with other similar things. It was all about scientific public outreach. It used to be much more lively back in the day. The sim was created by JPL engineer. Charlie White. Somebody must be still be paying the, the tier, and, and the tier is damn high. Um, well, somehow there is some pocket of money that pays for it, probably because it's peanuts compared to JPL budgets in general. Don't tell the Republicans this is government waste, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves. George, maybe you should introduce yourself and introduce to the listener what, what the heck is going on. Is this a radio program or what is this? Uh, please go ahead. Hello, my name is George Chergovsky and I'm a professor of astronomy at Caltech and in Second Life I'm known as Curious George and you are listening to the Drax Files Radio Hour with George Yardley. Welcome to the Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. My name is Drax Dupre. I'm in the physical world without Joe Yardley, but I am here with a second lifer, or at least a possibly ex-second lifer, but we will find out. And uh, his name in Second Life is Curious George. Hi, George. Hey, Drax. We are here in, in, in Munich, which is my hometown, and, and you're here at a conference for uh, e-science. We'll explain kind of what that is. But first, we need the, the waiter on tape. We're at an outdoors cafe in Schwabing. For roses? For roses? Like last night. With ice or? Ice. Ice. George is ordering. Ein Tafelwasser, bitte. Danke. Distractions of the physical world where we have to interact with other human beings. Uh, how inconvenient. Anyway, uh, George, please introduce yourself. My name in real life is George Jurgovsky. I'm a professor of astrophysics at Caltech. And in Second Life, I was director of MECA, the Meta Institute for Computational Astrophysics, which was, and probably, well, which was the first professional scientific organization based in virtual worlds. What is the status of that organization in the virtual world? Is it alive? Is it dead? Is it zombie-ish? It is dead. It was a finite duration experiment from 2008 to 2012. And it was an experiment to find out how we can use virtual worlds as a scientific platform. And tell me what you what you did. So you had you had a, a, a sim, and what were the activities like? What was the, the the concept, and who originated the idea? Well, the original idea came from my friend Pete Hutt, who is the professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. This is the place where Albert Einstein and John von Neumann were, and and, and Gödel. Um, and Pete is an astrophysicist, but he's also a very creative and unusual person. And at some point, he posted a couple preprints uh, on a web server that described his experiments using virtual worlds as a scientific collaboration platform. Now, I'm always intrigued about ways we can use information technology to do science and scholarship, so I started talking with him. and. Uh, that led into a, a small gathering, a mini workshop, if you will, in, in Princeton with some other astrophysicists and some experts in virtual worlds. And as a result, we formed MICA, the Meta Institute for Computational Astrophysics. We also got funding from the National Science Foundation because this was a fairly innovative thing to see if we can actually use virtual worlds for something serious, scientific or scholarly. So the kinds of things that we used to do uh, involve professional discussions, collaborative discussions. We even had series of professional seminars, very much like one would do in real world. We had speakers from the outside whom we would invite and, and they would give their talk. We even had a, a very brief conference once. 
we also had a very extensive outreach program, which became very popular among the science enthusiasts in mm -hmm. Second Life. We had a series of weekly lectures given by a variety of people, many of whom we recruited from the real world to do this for the first time. And many were recorded and probably still preserved on the web somewhere. Um, and finally, we started exploring scientific data visualization in virtual reality. Mm. And that is the one thing that I'm still doing, but not in Second Life. So primarily in Second Life, a platform to collaborate, to, to be together with a sense of space, um, something where people might say, why don't you do this over Skype? What's the advantage of a virtual world versus a teleconference? I hear that all the time. But then also the visualizations, we'll get to that later. But how would you respond, or how would you have responded back then uh, to people who would say, why do you need to um, sit in a simulated replica of, I don't know, an auditorium versus just be on a, on a Skype call? Well, like many other people, we discovered that somehow perceptions are very different in an immersive virtual reality, even a primitive one like Second Life was. Mm -hmm. That I think it's called the Proteus effect, that people identify themselves with their digital representation. And we found it to be a much more effective way in holding our attention in interacting with our colleagues. Mm -hmm. Way better than anything two-dimensional screen, Skype or, or other such things. In other words, a two-dimensional screen can actually be distracting. You're not really focused because you're, you're not, is that what you're saying? Because in a sense of space, like I'm sitting here with you right now, it would be very clear that I would be distracted if while you're talking, I would just read this, this book. Mm -hmm. But yes, I guess in Second Life you could do the same thing, I guess. Yes, but for some reason we don't. Mm -hmm. um, you feel that you're really there in conference room with your colleagues. Cool. The stereophonic sound helps, you know their voices. And so it's 90% of being really there. Mm -hmm. I think many others have found the same effect. This is why we persisted in trying to do this. The, the conferences and lectures, um, maybe I could classify those as also giving a, a, a front row seat to, to people who normally wouldn't have access to that kind of information or, or presentation, right? I mean, that's a, that's a democratization aspect that the Second Life has. That's right. And a lot of people don't live in big cities where you can actually find popular science lectures on universities and so on, and are really cut off from such things in real life. So this provided them with a good way of actually meeting real scientists and hearing the latest and, and so on. We actually had a Nobel laureate give some of our talks. Uh, he gave a professional seminar and two public talks. Mm -hmm. And that was very uh, interesting for everyone. Were you at that time connected to, or what is your relationship, or was your relationship with uh, Scilands? Our sim was part of Scilands. Before we started, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a lab run by Caltech for NASA, had their own sim. Let's drink first. Let's, in the physical world, we have to drink. Okay, so data visualizations. G can you give me an example of what, in, in that, as you, I think, uh, very accurately put it, a, a primitive time, also in virtual worlds, can you give me examples of what you guys did back then? Well, let me actually put this in a context. Uh, today, everybody talks about big data because everybody's drowning in data. But it's not really the size of data sets that's difficult. It's the complexity of the data that are getting ever more complex. And one way to look at this is uh, dimensionality of data sets. If you measure one thing for something, stars, cars, whatever, then you have one dimensional data set. Mm -hmm. If you measure two things, you have two dimensions, three and so on. But now there are data sets that have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of dimensions. And there is clearly something interesting going on in them, but how can you possibly visualize something in more than three dimensions? Because it can be argued that you don't really understand anything until you can visualize it in some way. So there is a premium on being able to visualize largest possible number of dimensions of the data. We're not talking about three-dimensional space, like even video games, Second Life mimic space. We're talking about abstract spaces, mm -hmm. like things that you plot on a paper on a screen, except now you're plotting it inside the virtual world. The advantage there is that being embedded inside your data gives you a much better intuitive sense 
for how data are distributed and what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, when you visualize data, you're outside looking in into the data. In virtual world, you're inside the data and looking out. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different perception. Tests have been done, including some by our collaborators, that show that people have a much better sense of geometrical relationships and remember them much better if they're in immersive virtual reality as opposed to doing looking at photographic panoramas. Mm -hmm. Does that have to do with the avatar's relationship to that data? When you, when you talk about being inside, because now when you're talking, I'm envisioning my avatar flying around some physical entity, but you're talking about abstraction. Right. Uh, we represent the data points as little spheres or cubes or pyramids and so on. We use the shape to encode information. Mm -hmm. You can use sizes of your data points as another dimension. Mm -hmm. RGB colors in principle give you three dimensions, but in practice really only two. And transparency is another one. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also put textures on your data points, and that can give you an additional space. And of course, their shapes are giving you uh, a dimensionality. This is more like for class variables, different types of things as opposed to numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use colors in that way. Mm -hmm. And some of our research currently is finding out how, what are the optimal ways of encoding what type of information. Because you have different perception of all of these things and some things you can do more precisely than others. And so essentially we're trying to look for best practices. Mm -hmm. How is it used in astrophysics? What is the application for what we study out there in space? A lot of data in astrophysics now come from sky surveys, where we patrol the sky repeatedly and for each of the sources, stars and galaxies and quasars and what have you, we measure usually tens if not hundreds of different numbers. So that defines the data space, and in that data space uh, there are some interesting relationship present, clustering of points or correlations or anomalies in outlayers or gaps, and you'd like to encode as many of them as you can, because if you have structure in some high dimensional space and project it down to a lower dimensional space, usually smear out of things. Imagine in some 3D scene where you have some cylinders and blobs and, and whatnot all arranged in space. But now if you project it down on a plane, the walls smush together and all of the structure will be lost. Now expand this to say going up to 30 dimensions and projecting down to 10. Now there are viewers or graphics packages that will do pseudo 3D rendering on your flat screen. But the difference again is that there you're on the outside looking in Whereas where you're inside the data themselves, you get a much better sense of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So scientists can not only interact with their data directly, but they can also interact with their colleagues at the same time. You can have multiple scientists embedded in the same data space, looking at things, drawing each other's attention on interesting things that they see and so on. Mm -hmm. And so this is the work that we're still continuing, and not in Second Life. Uh, we used OpenSIM for a little while, but then we moved on, we are now using Unity 3D library and developing special purpose software to do this. Mm -hmm. And with Unity, which I always think is probably the biggest competitor in, in that application for Second Life, works with um, Oculus, so are you already experimenting with Oculus with these data sets? Yes, we've been using Oculus from the get-go, first and second developer kits, and we'll plan to use uh, Follow lens in a few months when it comes out, um, and using also devices like Kinect to capture motions to navigate in virtual space, leap motion, the 3D mouse, and, and we're looking hard at other possibilities. So, for example, people expect that smart clothes will be something fairly common, mm -hmm. clothes where there are sensors. Then we're also thinking how can you use that to govern your path through virtual space. If you're wearing a headset, then you cannot see your keyboard, mm -hmm. right? And, but you always know where your hands are and where your arms are, and if you can capture their motions by touching your hand, touching your arm, making gestures, and so on, then you can use that to navigate through this immersive space. Let's go to why you and others, others in the scientific community lost interest in Second Life. There was 
enthusiasm for the space. You mentioned lots of colleagues. There was Silence, a bunch of islands together, like an archipelago of, of scientists. The interest veined first why with with you or you and your institution and then if you were to speculate or if you had conversations with other scientists who pulled out what were the primary reasons why the enthusiasm went away and then the projects well in the first place only a very small number of scientists felt intrigued enough to try this Mm -hmm. Most of my colleagues thought this was the craziest thing ever. And But I was going to say, because we talked about it uh, uh, earlier, that, that it does appeal. We were talking about the fact that it's so interesting, it appeals to certain people, but other people say this is, this is just crap. Most of them would look at me with obvious disbelief <laughs> and would not be persuaded to try. We But thought George had his marbles, but yes. we're not so sure anymore. I think that's exactly right. That's exactly what I thought. Um, We did bring in a bunch of colleagues who were, well, curious enough to at least try it. Mm -hmm. And some of them liked it and others found it a little too complicated. As you know, the learning curve is very steep and if you only do this one little thing, then, you know, why would bother? Right. But vast majority of our colleagues are simply not thinking at all about this kind of stuff. But most, they would see it as a game. Mm -hmm. Because superficially, it does look like a video game. And I think this is a generational thing. The new generations of digital natives would think this is a perfectly normal thing to be immersed in virtual space and to have an avatar and, and do stuff. Anecdotally, I have to disagree with you there slightly because I know a lot of older people who intuitively grasp what is going on and what they can do. And I, at the same time, know people in their 20s who are actually almost afraid of that space, that it sucks reality away from them. I think it's a matter of getting used to it. Yeah. And eventually, I do believe that we're going into some sort of 3D <laughs> web successor, and people will be using immersive and augmentative virtual reality without giving it a second thought, just like now they use the web browser. There's an age component to it, but I don't know if that's the whole, if that's the whole explanation why some people so vigorously are opposed or offended even by the idea of engaging with a virtual space. I'm talking about right now, I completely agree with yeah. you that at some point, just like the iPhone, everybody has one, everybody's using a touch screen. Second Life had a reputation of being a little crazy, well-deserved reputation, I should say. Um, and also it does superficially look like a video game. I myself was very skeptical about it when it first started appearing in the media and so on. And I was pretty much dragged into it. But once I found out uh, the possibilities, I became very enthusiastic and started proselytizing it with limited success, shall we say. So, but this was just one of the factors. Um, as many people, uh, I think, would say, Second Life has lost a lot through various mismanagement steps of Linden Lab. Um, The net result of which was that a lot of people have left, and in particular a lot of creative people, uh, content creators, have left. That made it much less interesting. Mm -hmm. In the heyday, which I would say is somewhere around 9 or 10 or something like that, there was always a lot of interesting stuff to do. There was some remarkably good art, uh, a novel form of art, not just replicating normal art inside virtual space but immersive art really kind of its own yeah, genre and, and uh, there were some amazing creations Bef uh, before we go i'm sorry i have to jump in here. i want to know how did you get dragged in there was it through your other colleagues well i shouldn't have said dragged in i was certainly intrigued enough to try i guess i wasn't interested until i saw pete's papers and started thinking about it talk to him and said well let's try it and then I found out. I think a lot of people are like that, yeah. that they just don't get it. And I always keep telling them, like, you know, this is like riding a bicycle. If you've never seen bicycle in your life, and I show you pictures of people riding bicycles, you'll never get it. Mm -hmm. Only when you actually ride a bicycle, you can get the idea what, what it's like. And I hear that uh, often the dismissal in And it makes sense in the academic community is that it's, uh, I guess, not serious because of the association with a video game. You know, we don't have to, we, have, we don't have time to play games. We need to be serious. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And another factor is that 
Linden Lab never really improved their products. The graphics of Second Life was very much 2005. And in the meantime, the game industry was exploding and the graphics quality got so much better. So young people, for example, who were interested in games or even World of Warcraft, not that I ever liked that, um, you know, just had a much more attractive op uh, right. option somewhere else. Yeah, I talked to teachers about that and, and that makes sense because when you're so you have a console at home and then your teacher says, hey, I'm cool, I got this thing for the classroom, let's do this. And then from your perspective as a student, you go, what is my old teacher dragging me into this <laughs> outdated stuff, right? I think that's right. I think there, there are many mismanagement steps and I think it's a, it's a tragic story because they could have really changed the world and, and they failed for a variety of reasons. Maybe. They couldn't. Maybe it was way too early anyway. But I think now we're clearly getting into the stage where virtual reality is bound to start dominating the way we interact with computers and information. Let me just say for the record, because the listeners know I'm biased, uh, I don't think it's a failure. Um, uh, I think it's a success for the individual. I just need to always put myself in. Um, I'm not a neutral interviewer. People know that. Hello, Hamlet. How are you doing? So the interest was waning primarily because you started to talk about uh, people were laid off, content creators left. What else? Uh, the moment when they stopped having educational pricing for Sims. That made it simply unaffordable for a lot of people who say work at small institutions that they had difficulty persuading their administration to do even a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when the prices double, they simply couldn't, and they couldn't justify it. I think that there were a lot of high expectations, uh, also including Second Life as an educational platform that didn't pan out. Yeah. And Did you ever try to use it uh, in that context with just teaching? Yes, we did, mm -hmm. um, and some of my colleagues did. And um, For example, a colleague of mine from Italy was visiting me at Caltech, and he was teaching class at the same time in Italy, so he had his students actually get avatars and listen to a lecture he gave inside Second Life. Mm -hmm. What was the feedback um, that you got from students? I think it was mixed. Um, you know, some of them thought this was really cool, others thought this was kind of weird, or it's just not up to the snuff mm -hmm. compared to the other things. Um, I made a point of asking students in different universities, I go I travel a lot to different places, give talks and so on, what do they use in social media and for interactions and of course they would always go with Facebook and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would ask specifically about virtual worlds and most of them had not a clue what I was talking about. It's amazing. On the one hand they're digital natives with a console yeah. game but then well, yeah, a virtual world. Video game, but they would they would regard it, this is just a video game. Mm -hmm. right. That is kind of paralleling my, my experience, it's interesting. I think the concept is still, it's esoteric in many ways. The question is why? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I think you require a critical mass of people. And that was also always a problem in Second Life, that there was so much empty space. I think they made a mistake in, in ha making it so easy to have so much space because mm -hmm. low density of people meant there is very little to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you always people, have the impression that no people. Is people are there because of other people. It's a, it's a social interaction platform more than anything else. I just want to remind the listener who uh, knows that, and I know, I hear the too little, too late thing all the time. We have Mesh and we have amazing content, uh, George. So you must visit us and see the amazing content that we have. Which leads me to the beef that I had with the article that was written about the abandoned campuses uh, of Second Life on um, Fusion uh, dot something. Uh, apparently a well-respected news blog. I was really surprised. I never heard of them. But I was surprised that a lot of the journalists that I admire follow them. Uh, on, on, on Twitter, but anyway, so I had an issue with this article because very selectively a journalist went to campuses that were abandoned in Second Life for whatever the reason was and wrote a piece about this. But there's nothing wrong, they can write whatever they want, but the assumption is when you pick anecdotally, you pick and choose 
failed examples of a second life use case, which is education, and then you conclude from that that the entire platform is unusable for that, that I find um, not good journalism. You commented uh, on, on, on Hamlet picking up that story with, yes, I, I, I forgot what your comment was, but, but you're, you know, you're laying out a very good case that um, Second Life is, for, for, for the multitude of reasons, didn't, didn't work out for most educators. That's a completely legitimate point. But didn't you have an issue with this article just so selectively... I don't know, am I hurt? Like, am I too defensive about this thing? Yes, you're too defensive about it. You take it too seriously. Um, uh, you're right. There was certainly a lot of very sloppy reporting about Second Life. Always was. And uh, on the other hand, it's a fact of life that it just didn't pan out. At one point, there were 300-odd university campuses in Second Life. A lot of people trying to experiment with a new technology. And... and for a variety of reasons, it, it just didn't catch on. Mm -hmm. And in, there are a lot of abandoned university campuses. It's a feedback loop. Once you have interesting people and content creators uh, start leaving, then there is very little reason for other people to stay. And so it, Second Life bled these creative people somewhere else. And so I would say it's a combination of society not being ready for it, Linden Labs been mismanaging things, uh, technology being a little premature, uh, and purely rational, subjective reasons or prejudices and so on. So it's, it's a mix of all those things. Can they turn the ship around? Because, I mean, my immediate response to the article, and I've commented on it, it's like, you know, I, I have plenty of examples where education works. I mean, I did one piece on Texas A&M University in the, in the chemistry department, but there are other departments that are using it. There's the University of Western Australia. There's the University of Kentucky is using it for anatomy classes. So my point when I commented on the article was, you know, I could, if I had the, the audience of that blog, I could make the the exact other case that, uh, which also wouldn't be accurate. It's just selective um, uh, examples where where it works. But yeah, I know I sound defensive, but I, I think it's it's completely unfair. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it can go it's a loop. Extreme. I mean, it's the it's the media loop because you you're mentioning the feedback loop, and that also applies to the media because if that comes out and people go, oh yeah, I knew it doesn't. Oh yeah, I heard about it, but now it failed. Oh yeah, right, it failed. Well, it's not just education; it's everything else that people try to do in second life businesses and and what have you. I mean, there were there were really high expectations which didn't pan out for whatever reasons, and then disappointment sets in and people just go away. Okay. And it's not just abandoned university campuses, it's abandoned commercial stuff too. Right, but I can tell you uh, that that is a discussion I have many times. There are so many examples where because of inflated expectations and really stupid corporate decisions in those companies that bought sims and bought concepts that everybody and their grandmother could have told them that would the, the ROI is never going to work out and they sink, sink money in it and then they blame it on the platform. I would blame it on marketing people who have absolutely no clue how to deal with digital spaces, uh, sorry, with 3D spaces. And I see almost a similar train wreck possibly coming now with the new VR boom. I mean, it could be. I mean, I think certainly Second Life was a textbook example of the hype curve, and hype curve squared. Um, will the new wave of VR fizzle out? I doubt it because the technology has gotten way better. And I think the world is ready. And, and it's all driven by the games, which are huge, huge industry. Mm -hmm. And that industry pays for development of commodity devices, like VR headsets and haptic motion sensors and so on. And I, I think at some point there is going to be a takeoff. Um, it might take year, might take five years, might take ten years, um, but I think it's at this point it's almost guaranteed to happen. Now I should say it's not immersive virtual reality itself. I think we will go first through augmentative VR stage because that will be easier for people to get used to and eventually we'll end up with some mix of 
physical reality and augmented and immersive virtual reality and people will be using them just like they use web browsers today. The technology is also at a point where it's, it's just much more compelling when you put the Oculus on or any other head-mounted display and the content is good, people are immediately convinced. Yeah, and Oculus is still a very primitive uh, headset. Mm -hmm. I think much, much better things will come. I think it's inevitable that we'll see a full high-definition 3D video uh, before too long. Now, you mentioned augmented reality, so you, you, you're convinced it goes also the augmented route because it's an easier way to get people acquainted to the, to the whole concept of, of non-existing objects being in, in your space there? I suspect that we will know a lot more within about a year after we see HoloLens in action, because HoloLens is really built for augmented VR, and it can be used for fully immersive VR as well. Um, but I think smartly they decided to go through augmented VR first. These are all transitional um, devices and we might end up with really stylish glasses, maybe even contact lenses, but before we know it. Well, I don't know about before we know it, but eventually I would say that that's certainly the trend that we will have some sort of maybe retinal projection glasses or, or even contact lenses. Uh, that might take 10 years, might take 20 years, I, I don't know. We may be surprised, it may happen sooner. Uh, and we'll just see what the industry comes up with. Back to Linden Lab, um, they're making a new virtual world. Is it also too little too late for them? Or what do you think, concept of a virtual world? Um, or is Unity enough to just build your individual things and uh, you have a plethora of dis displays that work with Unity? Do we even need a virtual world? Yes, I think we will have virtual worlds. They, they may be special purpose ones. Uh, they may be someday a worthy successor of Second Life, a really universal virtual world. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that that hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah, but maybe that points to the fact that we don't need it. I mean, Cloud Party came and when people said, oh, if it's on the web, then it's going to be big. No, it, it, it didn't pan out. No, I, I think just like in the early days of the web, there was no content. The browsers were clumsy. Um, when I first heard about the web, I thought nothing would come out of it for those reasons. But then people started... What Bill Gates thought, too. Yeah, but then, you know, people started coming up with clever new ideas and content. And, and once you have a critical mass, people come and then more people come and so on. And I think something like that is going to happen with the 3D successor of, of the web. Or maybe the web itself becomes the virtual world. I mean, I interviewed Tony Parisi, who uh, co-created the RML, and he's convinced that it's, you know, we have it. It's the web. Well, maybe, but there are technical reasons why the Internet and World Wide Web, as constructed now, are not really suitable for 3D version thereof. But there are clever people thinking about it, too. Now, as for Linden Labs in, in their new virtual world, well, I wish them best of luck. I have no idea how it's going to pan out. They definitely have a reputation that they failed once whether or not you agree. And that's going to weigh hard. I mean, they'll have to do something really awesome and get critical mass of users up quickly and growing. If that doesn't happen, nothing will work. And again, uh, I do not agree because the fact that they have sustained that world for uh, for over a decade is, is somewhat unique even you know, in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's a profitable product, however small it is, and it's over a decade uh, in existence. They haven't, they haven't shut it down yet. Yeah, but compare that with games, especially games where, where there is economy going on, like World of Warcraft had vastly, vastly larger cash economy than Second Life ever did. And that's a game. <laughs> Second Life pays out 60 million US dollars annually to content creators. I don't know the numbers of World of Warcraft, but I think the fact that they continue to, to do that should be a measure of success. I think the reputation of Linden Lab is actually in the virtual world business a good one. Yeah, of course. Second Life lives on, but it has shrunk and it has not improved. And I think 
it's game over. I think they really need something qualitatively different and better. Because mm -hmm. uh, competition is much, much higher now. We, of course, don't know yet what Facebook will do with their expensive acquisition of Oculus. Um, my initial reaction to that was, if they don't know what to do with their money, I, I could help them spend $2 billion much better. But nobody asked me. That is something, well, I'm on the record that I'm a little bit concerned about what they're building. If they just if they just uh, apply the Facebook model to a virtual world, I think then that, that, that could be pot potentially scary, uh, or at, at least not interesting to me personally or to, to a lot of other people. The, the more nuanced points, when we talk specifically about virtual spaces, there, there are things that they can build upon, that's what I think, is the currency. You're right, Google has Google Wallet. I mean, there, there are ways of payment, that is true. But to have a system that enables people to buy and sell virtual goods and, currency, uh, uh, virtual goods and services, in a currency that is exchangeable to, to physical currencies. I think that's a major aspect if you build any space, any, any virtual space. The question is, is, is it even of interest to build such a gigantic ocean liner and then run it? And I think this is my own sort of speculation, uh, the answer to the question why nobody has done that in Silicon Valley is probably because they look at Lid and I go like, oh no, we don't want to we don't want to hurt these million cats uh, for that little yeah. benefit. Maybe, maybe. Um, again, I, I, I'm of a belief that VR has a great future as our interface to the digital world, by which I mean people as well as information. And just like two-dimensional interfaces are big yeah. today. And we'll find out how that pans out. And then you don't have to have fake currency. I mean, on the web, you do commerce with real money. And so that will presumably happen in three-dimensional equivalent thereof. That is a good point. Why do I even need a virtual currency? That's a good question. That's why do people need Bitcoin? And at this point, governments are getting very interested in such things. And we'll see how that works out. So, George, will you ever visit Second Life again, or will you consent to maybe me giving you a tour of sure. good spaces? I'd love to. I, I log in every once in a while, sometimes actually do this for professional discussion. Yeah, I did see you a couple of months ago, whenever that was, it pops up in the corner, and I say, yeah. Curious, Curious George is, is online. I go, I can't believe it. A colleague of mine from Italy and I find out that we actually enjoy talking business in Second Life more than on Skype. Mm -hmm. And so why not? All right, that was George Drokowski, a.k.a. Curious George. Uh, of course, we're going to get him into Second Life and show him some really cool content. So if you know of places that he must visit or, or we have to visit, put them in the blog right now. Uh, we need to uh, prove to George that it's not game over, that it's in fact quite, uh, quite a vibrant society. Um, next week, of course, back to normal. Uh, I apologize for not having any news commentary. Uh, there's, there's obviously exciting stuff going on, including Linden Labs' um, public showing of uh, Project Sensor, which, by the way, is not an open house. Uh, as I hear from Pete Linden, it is specifically uh, targeted towards showing Project Sensor to the American Institute of Architects, uh, the AIA to show them what's possible with Project Sansar, so that makes sense to me. I think it's it, it was reported a little bit uh, uh, confusingly by some people out there. So Joe will be back next week, of course. Uh, we have origin stories, we have tons of stuff, and we have a new Drax Files World Makers video coming up midweek. Anyways, uh, from the real world uh, kitchen that was just completed by a bunch of really, really <laughs> talented carpenters who possibly would have benefited even more from Project Sensor, mapping out the kitchen Project Sensor. No, I'm kidding. I mean, they, these guys don't need a virtual world or anything to build this kitchen. I mean, I'm utterly impressed, but I'm getting completely off a tangent here. You guys have a great weekend. Thanks for listening and goodbye. The Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley is a weekly production of Basic Jacks Entertainment. 
The show is supported by Maven Homes, Giza Creations, Botanical, Strawberry Sing, Abranimations, Eros Avatars, Ison, Caravel Design, Humanoid Animations, Avacon, The Cube Republic, Loki Elliot, Fateware by Damien Fate, The Avazines Publication Family, What Next, Bright Canopy, Dutchy Furniture, Landscapes Unlimited, Dwarfins, The Den, Following Gods Incorporated, Feroche SL, Giant Snail Races Every Saturday, Kona Stream, and Death Row Designs. Contact the show via Skype, Drax Files, Avatar Drax Files, or email radio at draxfiles.com.